Okay, hopefully the, the chat works for me today. We'll find out. Okay, we can uh, go ahead and get started. So I assume you can see my shared screen here with the keynote slide deck. Uh, so our agenda for today will, I'll show you a brief tour of some web links in Canvas. Uh, show you uh, the Wiley Plus assessments that you need to be doing. Then we'll work on some uh, IR spectroscopy problems and get back into um, the, the IR problem that we had left about the, the three isomers with uh, C4H8O and get into a little bit of a beginning discussion of NMR spectroscopy at this point. So let me bring over my canvas. So hopefully you can all see my uh, canvas uh, module at this point. So I created this announcement um, called Organic Web Links. And so if you click in here, um, there's virtual textbooks that you can access. Uh, this one is at Michigan State, um, the virtual textbook of organic chemistry. The organic chemistry Libra texts are, um, I think there's a couple different resources if you click in there. Um, spectroscopy resources. So with spectroscopy, it's always good to look at as much data as you can to understand um, how different functional groups look in the different pieces of data. Um, so there's the spectral database for organic compounds. I use that quite a bit um, to, to pull example functional groups. The NIST web, uh, chemistry web book. Uh, the University of California, Los Angeles Web Spectra, and Notre Dame Organic Structural Elucidation. So maybe what I'll do is, uh, let me click this. I'll show you this. Um, so again, this, this is a virtual textbook of organic chemistry. It has, um, it, it's, it's really complementary to your, your course text, uh, but this is entirely free and somewhere in here there are some spec problems that you can do okay so let's let me click here spectroscopy so introduction to spectroscopy um and so this is laid out pretty clear cut uh I, again even though you have a course textbook 
you know, multiple sources of information are always good. Uh, so you can get a different viewpoint. So um, for example, let's click mass spectrometry. Here's, here's mass spectrometry. The actual inner workings of the instrument. Um, so a, a, a couple, couple of um, basically algorithms you can follow for solving what what a molecular formula is uh, isotopes um, isotopic abundance calculator so you could put a molecular formula in this box and it'll spit out what the m1 and um, m plus 2 should look like um, so this this is a really good resource to check out um, we won't talk too much about um, UV vis so much, but we, we've been talking about uh, IR. So this is a really nice um, run through of IR. So again, a, a graphical representation of where the different functional groups come. We've been calling this region one, uh, region uh, two with the triple bonds, region three with the double bonds, and then the fingerprint region. So here's, here's some tables. You can soak all this in. Where do stretchings occur? Again, this is a resource. Uh, I wouldn't try to memorize that myself. I would just use it as a resource. Um, so that's, that's the virtual textbook. Um, I'll open this UCLA website. We'll, we'll come back to this today, actually, because there's a lot of good problems where you can really put everything together. Uh, so that's that's that announcement. Um, let's go to modules. <clears throat> Again, uh, you should be working on your chapter 14 and 15 readings, doing your homeworks for 14 and 15 and your Orion sets. Uh, again, do just do a little bit each day and that way it doesn't become uh, a monumental task. Um, I, I don't know really how it is with the online learning environment, um, but if, if this was face to face, I, I think a normal student behavior is to leave the homework sets and, and things like that until like the day before the exam with the thought process that I'm going to do all these. It's going to be fresh in my mind and I'm going to go into the exam and I'm going to do well. Um, so from my observation as an instructor, that's probably the worst strategy you can have um, because you want to you want to do a little bit each day so that you can let this stuff marinate in your mind and think about it. Trying to cram it in at the last minute is, is usually not the, the best uh, way to do to do this. Um, so so that's again, look for these announcements. Um, look to do some of your homework uh, each day. So we'll come back to this uh, web link here in a little bit. Uh, but why don't we go ahead and get started? Uh, so we'll, we'll have some questions. I just want to review um, the general regions of an IR spectrum. So again, region one is your CH, your OH, and your NH stretching. That's usually from about 2700 to about 3800. Uh, again, don't get so caught up on memorizing specific numbers because that's really not not going to do you well. Uh, you, you, you're looking for certain patterns or how things look in terms of a picture. So region two is the triple bond region, alkyne, nitrile, azide. That's from about 2200 to 2500. And the most really diagnostic is region three with the carbonyl region. The CN pi bond, that's called an imine, and the CC pi bond, that's alkene. So due to the differences in electronegativity, the bond dipole moment decreases along this trend. So this is the greatest. Um, this gets weaker and that gets even more weaker. And so what that means is because the IR light is per per perturbing the bond dipole, the signal intensity gets weaker. So carbonyls are the strongest, alkenes are the weakest. The fingerprint region, again, we really ignore because it gets pretty complicated. So let me go ahead and ask you some questions and you can type your answers in the chat. And I think the chat is working today, so I should be 
OK with looking at your responses. So you're given an IR spectrum. So that's the first thing you should be able to do is look at that and recognize, OK, this is an infrared spectrum. On the X axis, I have wave numbers. On the Y axis, I have uh, transmittance. So they're showing it as just uh, basically from uh, 1 to 0, or this could be percent transmittance from 100 to 0. So given this spectrum, which functional group is present? So this is asking you sort of multi-layered concepts. Um, given these condensed formulas, can you can you write the name? Do you know how they look? Um, when you draw the Lewis structures, the bond line structures. So, so what diagnostic peak or peaks do you see in the IR that would belong to a functional group present A, B, C, or D? So the majority of the responses so far are D. And why, why, do, why did you choose D? So maybe just in a brief couple words in the chat, type a couple words. What was your, your thought process? So Hannah says, looks like alcohol. So yeah, if we if we look at this, this is a diagnostic peak here for an alcohol OH stretch. So Taka also says it lacks a, a carbonyl stretch. And so yeah, if you look at these other three choices, A, B, and C, we have a carboxylic acid, we have an aldehyde, we have a ketone. Those all have carbonyls, right? And so we don't see a carbonyl in region two between 17 and 1800. So the lack of that signal can eliminate choices A, B, and C. So again, uh, as, as the instructor of this class, it's, it's sort of um, what I am attempting to do is, is you know, help you think through these problems. Um, you know, getting the right answer uh, obviously is, is a feel good moment uh, and, and we want we want to do that, but we want also want to articulate how we came to that right answer. And that's I think the most important thing is is connecting all of these concepts. So Hannah asks, can you review the 3000 area? So um, again, uh, just just to put this all in context, <clears throat> infrared uh, as the title says, is really only telling you functional groups. And remember how we defined a functional group is a, a specific collection of, of elements. So for example, uh, if you look at these choices A, B, C, and D, they all have R. R can be anything. The functional group here is the acid, and this is how we abbreviate it, CO2H, aldehyde CHO, ketone COR, alcohol OH. So what's present in the R part of those is, you know, all types of carbon-carbon bonds, carbon-hydrogen bonds. So in this region here, region one, every molecule we look at has CH stretching, right? So it always is going to occur there. So that is not terribly diagnostic to differentiate one functional group from another. So in this spectrum, what you see is this, this broad peak here from say 3700 going to about 3100. So that, that stretch is, is different from a CH stretch and it belongs to an OH stretch. And that, that is the OH stretch of an alcohol. And the reason this stretch is so broad, so I would say it is it's a strong stretch because the transmittance is is pretty low. That means it's it's absorbing a lot of that IR light. It has low transmittance, so it's strong and then it's broad. The reason it's so much broader is because the OH group can hydrogen bond. So that that sort of um, the IR light is seeing all those different types of 
OH uh, stretching and, and hydrogen bond stretching environments. So again, below 1500 is the fingerprint region. You can see there's a lot of signals in this area and those get way too complicated for us. Again, I posted the finally posted the IR screencast on YouTube. It's linked through Canvas. Go ahead and watch it. And, and you're looking for the diagnostic stretches for each functional group. So here's another one. It's giving you a clue. Uh, based on the given IR spectrum in the hint that there's one degree of unsaturation present, uh, what is the functional group represented in this IR spectrum? So again, consider consider what you're given. You're given that IR spectrum, and you're also told that the functional group has one degree of unsaturation. So I, I see a lot of uh, a lot of a lot of B's, a lot of A's. So let me let me ask the people that that put down B as in boy. How many degrees of unsaturation does an amine have in it? So maybe in the chat, an amine, the amine functional group. How many degrees of unsaturation are present? So there's James said there's none. So the answer cannot be B. Aiden says uh, the the hydrogen region seems ambiguously broad. Um, I, I would. <coughs> I can understand why you would think that, um, but in terms of it being an acid, um, in, in the way I understand or interpret IR spectra of acid, that that does not look like an acid signature to me. So in this region here, um, an acid would would typically, you know, you'd see the OH of the acid start about here and then drop down. And then it, it would actually merge into this stretching here. So remember with an alcohol, the OH sort of comes down and then it goes back up and you get a little baseline separation. An acid, it merges in. So there's no acid OH peak here. It's not an amine and it's not an alcohol because you don't see any NH or OH stretching. And, and none of those amine or alcohol have a degree of unsaturation. So the correct answer is an ester. And so this peak here, uh, I know it's hard to sort of see, but this is 1500. That's 2000. So split the difference is about 1750. So that's your carbonyl of the, of the uh, ester. So let's let's do another one. And again, I'm, I'm pulling these spectra from different sources, so that's why they probably all look a little bit different. I think I got this one from the website Sigma Aldrich. This one is from the uh, the Japanese site, the SDBS website. So based on the functional group or based on the IR spectrum in the molecular formula C487N, what functional group is present? Primary amide, tertiary amine, ester, or nitrile. OK, 
Can you guys all see? Um, can you guys all see these numbers? So maybe I can maybe I can put a shape here. Just to help you out. So I'll change the color of that to red. Make it a little thicker. So that line is 1500. This line is 2000. So Aiden, do you want to reconsider your your response, your initial response there? So we're, I'm, I'm seeing the majority of answers pop up as D, which is nitrile. And so uh, what what are the, the hints or clues for that? So if you calculate degrees of unsaturation for this molecular formula, it ends up being two. So two degrees of unsaturation, the presence of a, a single nitrogen. Um, that that the best answer is nitrile and this strong peak here. So if we're at 2000, 21, 22, 23, 24. Okay, so that's 25 there. So about 2250, this peak here, that is a, a carbon nitrogen triple bond stretch. So again, that's region two, it's nice and strong. The reason this cannot be an amide is because the molecular formula does not contain an oxygen. Also, there is no carbonyl. So even though this sort of looks um, so this is probably about 1600. Again, this peak right here is really not very diagnostic in my opinion. A carbonyl is gonna have a really strong um, absorption, so the transmittance number will be low. It'll be a really strong peak. So it, it can't be an amine um, because we're saying there's two degrees of unsaturation. Again, there's no carbonyl for an ester, also the molecular formula has no oxygens. So again, I, I try to give you enough uh, data that you can sort of eliminate these different choices, um, you know, using some chemical logic. So uh, if, if you look at one, one thing, you know, for a student just learning how to interpret IR, so this stuff here, that, that can definitely look like maybe some primary amide NH stretching. Um, but again, I, I think, um, you know, those type of stretchings are much stronger. So instead of seeing like, I would say this is a weak intensity and obviously the, the normal SP3 hybridized carbon H stretching is strong. So if, if this were an amide, you know, the, the, the intensity would be, you know, around down here or so. So, yeah, this this is the triple bond peak right here. So if if. Um, normally what I would do with uh, every every new cohort of 255, I would say you know, uh, go by the ACS Organic Chemistry Study Guide, study it because in 256, we're gonna have a, a standardized exam. But since we're online this year, um, we really haven't followed the normal face-to-face -face protocol. But this problem is taken from the ACS Study Guide and it says which compound is consistent with this IR spectrum. So here are your wave numbers. So these, these look a little clearer to me with the, the lines and the grid and then your percent transmittance. So, so this one, um, this is a typical American Chemical Society uh, problem uh, that you would see on the standardized exam. Obviously, there's one correct answer and then there's a, a couple three distractor answers. So I see the majority of people picking C. So what's wrong with, with choices 
A, B, and D. Why wouldn't you pick those? What what went through your mind to eliminate A, B, and D? Because that's just as important as getting the right answer. So yeah, two, two main things are popping up. There's no OH group in any of those. And so none of these have an OH group, which is belongs to this peak here. And then and the spectrum itself does not have a carbonyl. So there's a carbonyl, carbonyl, carbonyl. So again, you know, if you consider an alcohol versus a carboxylic acid, the spectrum you're looking at is an alcohol. See this? See, th see how this OH group looks? See how it, it, it rises back upwards the baseline and there's sort of this separation between OH and SP3 stretching, SP3 hybridized carbonate stretching. So this signature is what an alcohol looks like. Now a carboxylic acid, this this sort of baseline separation, it, it moves down. So you do not see this separation. This peak just sort of continues here. So it's all merged into one broad peak and also an acid is going to have a carbonyl. So those are those are the type of. of I don't know if, if you were like doing an algorithm with a flow chart, you know, is is there an OH? Yes or no? Is there a carbonyl? Yes or no? And so that gets you sort of narrowed down in terms of the functional groups. So let's let's do another one. So again, this is from the ACS book. So again, obviously there's one correct answer, but then there's the, the three other ones. The three other ones have something in common. What do the three other ones have in common that you can eliminate them from the choices? So Katie is saying the hydrogen bonding region, so that's exactly right. So A has an OH, C has NH2 and then D has OH. So these heteroatom H bond, uh, you should see stretching sort of in this region. And since there's nothing there, you can eliminate those as the possible right answer. So as you see here, 15, 16, 1700, this is going to be the ketone. So one one thing that you want to consider again i'm not writing your exams i'm taking exams from the test bank associated with your textbook but in terms of developing the logic or the chemical intuition you've you've learned a lot of functional groups that have carbonyls in them right so aldehyde ketone carboxylic acid ester amide and hydride acid chloride they all have carbonyls so you're going to see that in every ir spectrum of those functional groups so what other thing then differentiates them amongst each other and so that's that's where you can use um the, the sort of logic so for example c and d both have a carbonyl both have some sort of heteroatom H stretching. This has OH, this has NH2. Well, the carbonyl for an amide is, it occurs at a much lower wavelength than the carbonyl for an acid, and that's due to resonance. This lone pair on nitrogen donates into the carbonyl. This has less double bond character, so the stretching moves below 1700. 
The other thing is the NH2 region for an amide looks different than an OH region for an acid. Whereas this is nice and broad, um, th these tend to be a little bit more defined. So not, not as broad, but a little sharper in terms of the slope moving down. And so those are just subtle things that you pick up when you, when you look at a lot of these spectra. So Mac is asking which functional group represents the peak at 3000. So this stuff right here, I assume is what you're asking about. So as, as Aiden says, th those are the, the SP3 hybridized carbon, carbon H stretching. Again, every molecule, look at, look at the carbon chains here in A, B, C and D. So look at all these different types of, of CH stretching. All that occurs here. All of those molecules have it. It's always going to occur there. So really, it's not very diagnostic. It, it's just normal. So let me, um, while we're at it, just just show you. Um, The, the other slide deck, and again, this this was published in on YouTube, and the link is through Canvas. So this is what took me so long to make. But um, I basically in in these slides, I go through each functional group and point out the main things. So let me just show you for alkane. So the condensed formula the degrees of unsaturation, the diagnostic signatures. So this is what I mean by SP3 hybridized carbon H stretching. It always occurs there. And so um, if you look, if you look at this spectrum, it's it's a static picture, right? It's like a Polaroid. And again, what is happening is that the IR light is, is sweeping across that part of the, the spectrum. So you're sweeping across, the IR sees nothing. And when you see a signal, the IR light is then hitting a bond dipole. So what, what does that actually mean? And that's what this little movie will show you here. So when you actually see a signal, so you actually, now that would, that would be like asymmetric stretching. So notice, um, as the cursor moves in this movie, you're going to see different types of CH stretching. So that's, that's again, sort of different type of asymmetric stretching. And now this, this would be symmetric stretching. So that's what this signal means, is that the IR light is hitting a bond dipole and the bonds are stretching. So let me show you, let me show you actually, um, Again, again, this this is posted, so you can go through all these functional groups. Um, so here's an alcohol. The major diagnostic signature is in region one for OH. That's what we see here. Here's the little movie. So that's that's what this means. See this this signal here? Is that OH group is stretching? And now here's your normal SP3 hybridized carbon H stretching. Again, it looks like a little dog walking along the sidewalk. Now he's happy. So again, that's that's really the physical phenomena between what, what this sort of static picture is. So I, I, I go through all these functional groups um, in the video. The video is about 40 minutes. Um, so you can spend time watching it, stopping it, you know, rewinding it. But this gives you an idea of, of what these static spectra actually mean. So um, what I'd like to do um, is the following. We, we sort of, um, we were working on this problem 
where you were given a mass of 72, an absorbance of 1730 wave numbers. That's telling you it belongs to a carbonyl. And uh, I think I'm going to switch over to the dock cam. Hopefully you can see that and it's in focus. Um, so from that, we had determined that the, the molecule was two butanone looking at um, this, this NMR spectrum. Does everyone remember this NMR spectrum? So let me just briefly go through, go through this again. Uh, it's not focused, so let's try to focus it. Okay, so the molecule was 2-butanone, and we had decided that <clears throat> of the carbons, there were four unique carbons. So I, I've, I've sort of numbered them according to the nomenclature, but that also helps us determine the unique carbons as well. There were four unique carbons. Three of them were sp3 hybridized, and one of them was sp2 hybridized. So of the four, we now have resolution, right? There's two different types of hybridization. Then of these three sp3 hybridized carbons, we said there were two of them were CH3, so CH3, CH3, and then one of them was CH2. So through this thought process, we're, we're able to like think, think deeper. We're getting deeper and deeper. So the same thing for the, the, the um, protons. We said there were three unique sets. We have methyl, methylene, and methyl. So ratio of three to three to two. And then this data here is what you're seeing on the screen. And what I've just, I've just rewritten this data. See, I'm circling it with my mouse. So for a proton NMR spectrum on the x-axis, we have zero to the right in it. That the spectrum runs to the left with 10 at the very left. See how these peaks are all clustered? And I've written down here the chemical shift. That's what this delta means. And the unit is parts per million. So the first peak, as we're reading uh, right to left, that we run into is at 0.8. The number 45, I'm calling that the integration. We keep reading. We're at about 2.0. We see another peak that integrates to 45. And really all that is, if you look, see this, this curve here, this line? That's called an integral. So it sort of looks like an integral in calculus. This number is basically measuring, if you take a ruler and you measure from this, this bottom to this top, that would be like, say, 45 millimeters. And then the third peak, we're at about 2.4 now. That integrated to 30. And then what we did, we we took uh, the lowest number, 30, and then divided every other number by that. So 45 divided by 30 gets 1.5, 1.5 and one. So yeah, Hannah's question is a good one. Even even I don't I don't know how to do that. How to project? Um, how to how to like screen share the actual uh, doc cam? I'm not really sure how to do that. I don't see it in the device settings at all. So this is like in Gen Chem when you're determining a molecular formula. So um, because you end up with these uh, sort of decimal points, you have to multiply by an integer. And that integer is going to be 2. So look, we get 3, 3, 2. And 
that going back to what we already empirically determined through observation 332. So this this is the actual. This is data. We converted that data into these ratios, which we sort of already determined just through a thought experiment. So now what I want to ask you before we move into the, the carbon aspect of this. Is is. Um, let me redraw the molecule here. So it, it, when we when we name this compound, we start here one, two, three, four. So that's two butanone. So look at these two peaks here. See how those two peaks are like clustered near one another on the screen, and then there's this this sort of one one part per million gap. The fact that these two peaks are near each other and then one of them is two protons. We can say that that this peak here. Again, that has two hydrogens to it and we determined here that the peak at 2.4 had two hydrogens, so we can make the assignment that those hydrogens belong to the peak at 2.4. Does that make sense to everyone? Anna is quick to respond no. Thank you through back up. So remember when we were given this compound and I asked you to determine how many unique sets of hydrogen there were? We said there were three, correct? So basically one, two, three. So of those of those three unique sets, there's CH3, CH2, in CH3, correct? So these are the three unique sets. This has three hydrogens. This has two hydrogens. This has three. So that's where we get these numbers, right? Now what we're looking at and what I've what I've tabulated here This is the experimental data which is shown in this spectrum. The red numbers again are called integration numbers and really what what the software is doing it's integrating the area under that curve. So AUC area under curve. And so what I've just shown you in red are our ratios 30 45 45. So that's what we've I've, I've taken where that signal occurs and I've just written that number. Because 30 is the lowest. And I want to determine the ratio of these. I'm taking all of them divide by 30. You get 1.5, 1.51. Because we want to deal with whole numbers, we have to multiply by some integer. So the smallest integer we can multiply by is two. That gets us three to three to two. And what what this ratio is, it's 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 already what we determined. Um, trying to get all this in the in the in the view of the doc cam. Is that still is that clear still? So what we've done with the data was determine the ratios that we determined up here. 
So notice for this peak at 2.4, that's the only one that has two. And then from here, this is the only one that has two. So we can say that the peak at 2.4 has to belong to that group there. So Alexis is asking about decimal, exact decimal points. Um, I was just estimating for these. So, so we, we've done an assignment. We were given a structure, we were given data, and we've assigned that carbon three, the protons belong to the, the, the peak at 2.44 or 2.4 ppm. Now, what about, what about this, this signal here, 0.8? in this signal here, 2.0. They each have three hydrogens. So we know they're going to be methyl groups, right? CH3, CH3. The methyl groups are at position one and four. So how can we make a, an actual assignment? So what do you think that the peak at 0 0.8 belongs to? Which carbon? What about the peak at 2.0? Which carbon does that belong to? So Aiden says carbon number four belongs to the peak at 0 0.8. And why do you say that? Um, because it's far enough away from the carbonyl group to not be shifted. And 0 0.8 is around the baseline for a uh, methyl hydrogen. So yeah, if, if everyone heard what Aiden just explained, so this this signal right here is 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 far away from the carbonyl, and so it, it resembles sort of a normal chemical shift for an sp3 hybridized carbon H uh, signal. So the other thing you can look at, as I was, I was pointing out, see how this one, this, this peak at 0 0.8 is separated from these other two? So if we know that at 2.4, because that integrated to two hydrogens, it's this, these hydrogens here on carbon three, we can say that the hydrogens on carbon one belong to the peak at 2.0 ppm because look, they're right next door to the carbonyl. So they should occur in the same region, right? So the peak at 2.0 belongs to carbon one. The peak at 2.4 belongs to uh, the protons on carbon three. And then the peak at 0 0.8 ppm are the hydrogens on carbon four. So we, we've used some, some logic to figure out just looking at this structure in the relationship between things, how we can then differentiate these. So again, with, with in the table here, this is sort of like
the the way we can we can separate out or resolve these different types of hydrogen. So let's let's now consider um, the the carbon data. We said there were four unique type of carbon. We resolve them to three sp3, one sp2. Of the sp3, two were methyl, one was methylene. So now we're back on the screen, the slide deck. Um, I'm looking at the C13 NMR spectrum. So to answer Aiden's question, carbons one and three are allylic. And I'll, I'll talk about that term on the next slide here. So I want you to focus initially right now, see where it says proton decoupled? That's the spectrum right here on the bottom. That's the one we're going to look at first, proton decoupled. You see this signal here which says solvent? That solvent belongs to this CDCL3, so we ignore that. Ignoring that in looking at this spectrum, how many peaks do you see on this spectrum? So there's four. So look. Look from our thought experiment. Remember when we said we would see four? That's what we're actually seeing now, right? Now, of the four that you see, do you see resolution amongst the four that you could make an assignment right now? Do you see like a, a, what I, I guess what I'm asking? Do you see a group of three and then uh, one separated somewhere? So based on the responses, where do you see this one? Where do you see the sp2 hybridized carbon? So maybe let's let's throw out a number and in, in, instead of the term downfield for now. So yeah, I, I think probably Probably 210 maybe is, is a better, yeah, 210. So Hannah asks, where are the four peaks? There's one here at 210, that's the SP, 210 ppm. That's the SP2 hybridized carbon. Then we have this cluster of three, right? One, two, three. We're back on the screen. One, two, three. So there's that cluster of three, and then there's the fourth one. So just by di by differentiating according to hybridization, we were able to look at the actual spectrum and say, the one that's really far apart, that has to be the sp2 hybridized one. Because all these other ones, sp3 hybridized, they have hydrogens on them. So now we're, we're back down in this region between 0 and 40. Can we then differentiate amongst these? Notice even in that cluster of 3, 
there, there's some separation between two of them and one of them, just like we saw with with the proton above it, right? So look at this peak, say at, uh, I don't know, like say maybe like eight or so. What do you think this peak belongs to? Which carbon? So we've, we've already assigned carbon two. That's the sp2 hybridized carbon. We're looking for one, three, or four. So Alexis says four. So yeah, we'll we'll put that at we'll we'll say it's about uh, about eight parts per million. And again, the logic we're using is is as we did above. Carbons one and three are are next to the carbonyl, right? So those should occur in the relatively same region. So we see those about 30 to 40. This one is different, so that one should be carbon four. So what about the remaining two? So for carbon NMR, we just looked at proton decoupled. And notice how the signals look. It's just a straight line. But above that, there's a thing called proton coupled. And what that what it what that means is that the signal that you 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 see, it's it's actually um, it's telling you how many hydrogens are bonded to that carbon. So look at the one that was at about eight parts per million here. And again, I'm on the screen. I'm moving my mouse. We said we said that belonged to carbon four. Carbon four was a methyl group, right? CH3. How many lines do you count in this peak shape that I'm circling now? So yeah, in the proton coupled, there's four lines. So can you can you make an observation that if this this signal here in the decoupled spectrum is the CH3 group, then you see it in the in the coupled thing and it's four lines. What what's sort of the relationship? Going from decoupled to coupled. So Taka says M plus one. So as I've written here on the doc cam, a decoupled spectrum, everything looks like a single peak. If you go to the coupled spectrum, it's M plus one. So look, look where my red pen is, C carbon three. That has two hydrogens, right? So in the coupled spectrum, what should that look like? How many lines should, should this carbon signal look like in the coupled spectrum? How many lines would you see? So three lines. So we have two plus one is three. So what would be the chemical shift for carbon three now? In, in the chat, just write a chemical shift. So again, this is where you're reading the chemical shift number. So for Garima, in the proton decoupled N uh, carbon NMR, notice the signals all look like single peaks. 
but when it's proton coupled, the peaks change. See this peak? This peak is this peak, but with a different sort of um, um, consideration of how many hydrogens are bonded to that carbon. So we said this was methyl, that's three. We see four lines. So uh, basically we're, we're operating under the assumption of M plus one. So Aiden says the CH2 group carbon should occur between 35 and 40. Yeah, let's just call it say like 37. Because look at the line above. You see you have one, two, three lines. One, two, three. So this has to be carbon one because we see one, two, three, four lines. So we'll say that's 10, 20. We'll say this is about 29 right there. So what we've done today is we've we've sort of begun to look at how the thought experiment of uniqueness for carbon and hydrogen and then the ratios of the carbon hydrogen sets can actually be uh, useful in interpreting the actual data. So again, the, the top here is the proton spectrum. The bottom is the C13 spectrum. And we've done the assignments for this molecule 2-butanone. And what I'll pick up with on Friday is we'll actually go through where these different functional groups occur on each spectrum. That's similar again to IR where you see certain stretchings in certain regions. While the phenomenon is different for NMR, you still see different functional groups in different regions. So we'll, we'll pick up on that on Friday and we'll also look at more problems. So in particular, if you look back at the doc cam, uh, well, I'll give you some data, some IR, some mass spec and NMR data, and we'll, we'll put it all together and solve the structure of an unknown. So if you have any questions in the meantime, uh, shoot me an email and we'll set up a Teams meeting for 30 minutes. Uh, but in the meantime, please start, you know, do a couple problems in your Wiley Plus. Check out that IR video and uh, we'll, we'll see you all Friday.